All right, Ed, everyone who was in the waiting room has managed to join and I will continue to let people in as they show up. Great, okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, it's terrific to see so many folks here today. I'm Ed Herman, the Executive Director of the IU Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, today's host. Um, thank you so much for making time to be here today. We have a terrific talk in store. Um, everyone should be aware that we will take questions. And if you have questions for George, please put them um, in, in the chat and we will be able to address them at the end of the talk. But before we begin, the IU Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology acknowledges and honors the indigenous communities native to this region and recognizes that IU Bloomington was built on indigenous homelands of the Miami, the Shawnee, the Potawatomi, and the Delaware people. We respect indigenous people and their many descendants who traversed and resided in the place, in this place here at uh, in Indiana and who have fashioned and used the objects that repose in this museum. The museum is committed to participating and collaborating with indigenous partners on the co-creation of knowledge and scholarship and, and education. And one of the partners that we've had the, the great honor of working with over the past few years is today's speaker, George Ironstrack. George is a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma and the assistant director of the Miamia Center at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. In addition to being a knowledgeable historian, George is a gifted educator with an interest in indigenous pedagogical practices. He is specifically focused in Miami education and has assisted with the organization and administration of the tribes of Wansapita, uh, summer educational experience since its inception in 2005. Over the past few years, he's been involved in work uh, at Indiana University and other state institutions, initially through service here at IU, the Glenn Black Laboratory of Archaeology's advisory board, and more recently in collaborating heavily, I might say, with the IU Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology as we develop the museum's inaugural exhibits. We're very thankful that he's been willing to share both his historical knowledge and his linguistic knowledge uh, with us in that process. Today, George will speak about picking up the threads of our knowledge, revitalization of Miamia or Miami Indian language and culture. Um, with no further ado, welcome, George, and thank you. Newe, Newe, Ed, Newe, Sarah, Newe, Newe, Ayuma, Quichumiane, Piaane, Awaha, Nungipe, Kondeke, Aya, Aya, Cheke, Newe, Pia, Yique, Awaha, Nungipe, Kondeke, Kihke, Linda, Kaninge, Nila, Mia, Mia, Meto, Senya, Meme, Shekio, Inzuane, Takamwa, Sakachakwa, Palanaswa, Penjewa, Lapacasiane, Nujongi Sipionge, Wapangia Kamionge, Nehe, Wapa Sheki Sipionge, Miamiake, Eminute Cheke, Shikakonge, Eminutiane, Anila, Neh Nunge, Mehkimuane, Miamia Nepayone Kaninge, Miamia Mission de Ponde Kaninge. Nungipe konde ke a chumuyane emba pikinamangwe kine pa Um I start off by saying newe uh, to Ed and uh, Sarah and the museum for bringing me in tonight virtually. Um, and that it's good to see all of you here on your computer screens. Um, wish we could be in person. Hopefully that will change sometime in the very near future. Um, but this is a turned turned out over time to be a pretty good substitute and um, found. Uh, Zoom to be a wonderful way to connect with people that I never would have had a chance to before. So I hope that's the case tonight. Um, as Ed said, I'm a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, um, and I descend specifically from uh, two family groups um, that in French or English are known as the Godfroy and Richerville families. Um, but I have Miamia kin in all three Miamia homelands in the Neosho River Valley in Miami, Oklahoma, 
in the Lazine River Valley in eastern Kansas and in our longest and oldest homelands in the Wabash River Valley in what is today Indiana. Um, I myself am from Chicago originally. Chicago is where um, I was born. Um, but today I, I work at the Miamia Center at Miami University and live in, in Oxford, Ohio. And tonight, as, as Ed said, I'm here to talk to you about um, picking up the threads of our knowledge, um, a, a, a overview of Miamia revitalization over the last, um, over the last 30 years. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Can everyone see that all right? Yeah, perfect. So unfortunately, again, due to COVID, we don't have a good group shot of the entire staff of the Miamia Center. So this is a, a, a third of us um, in a small cross-section photo from shortly before the shutdown, um, right after we had a nice renovation of our building that we couldn't show off um, due to COVID. Um, but I work with a wonderful set of colleagues, who many of whom are my relatives. Um, they're tribal citizens, but many of whom are not tribal citizens, but have just over time um, decided to link their arms together with us and work with us on um, the the needs of the Miami community, both at Miami University and um, beyond. And then I also want to emphasize um, my community. So I'll, I'll be talking as much as possible about my personal experience and trying to where I can to successfully generalize about what I'm observing in my community. But um, I, I work for them and I want to emphasize that as much as possible. And that um, while I, in some cases, can summarize a little bit, I can't, I can't speak for the diversity that's in my community. Um, and uh, just like all of us who belong to different kinds of communities, I sure am missing being face-to-face -face in community with them. Um, this is from a, a really fabulous uh, lacrosse game that happened in, in the summer of 2019 in Miami, Oklahoma. Um, the first game to use um, all wooden sticks in uh, multiple generations for our community. And I'm looking forward to getting back on the field with them at some point soon. So I'm going to start today before I actually launch into discussing revitalization with just some background into the, the Miami tribe as a contemporary tribal nation. And I realize that uh, for many of you in the room, um, you might be aware of a lot of these things already, um, but um, I, I've learned to be careful and start from kind of a ground zero and make sure that everyone understands my tribe as a living community um, and a, as a sovereign nation. Um, so this is a, a shot of Indian country um, showing reservations in the United States, um, as well as other forms of Indian land. And you can see most of the big reservations are in, in, the, um, in the western states. Um, and the place where you are located and I'm located, um, oftentimes internally we talk about it as the, as the donut hole because it's been emptied of tribes due to the history of um, warfare, treaties, and then forced removal. Um, and so there are no, well, I guess now there is one fairly recognized tribe located in the state of Indiana up in the extreme north of my relatives in the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi. Um, but for the most part, um, and for most of my life, there's been no sovereign entities operating within uh, Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois. The three red dots uh, highlight the main population centers of the Miami Nation today, and I'll come back to that later on. Um, but um, the Miami tribe is located in uh, what is today the state of Oklahoma, former Indian Territory. And um, as you can see, it's a pretty complex place. Um, Indian country is always complex. Oklahoma is special and interesting in the complex places in Indian country. There's 39 tribes located in the state of Oklahoma today. And the uh, sovereign status of those tribes um, is um, interesting in the way that we interplay with each other and the way in which we interact with the state and obviously the, the federal government. Um, my tribe is a pretty small tribe um, in comparison to most tribes in Oklahoma. Um, and we were, I think, the last tribe to arrive in Indian Territory after the second forced removals from Kansas after the U.S. Civil War. And we ended up buying into a shared reservation with our cousins in the Peoria tribe who speak the same language and practice a very similar culture to us. And so we're up in the extreme uh, northeast uh, corner of um, what is today Oklahoma in Ottawa County, where there are nine tribes in the county and eight tribes in the town of Miami itself. 
Um, so, you know, in Oklahoma, we might be in the most complicated corner of Oklahoma in terms of the number of tribes um, that are there. Many of these tribes um, are from, originally, have homelands in uh, Indiana and Ohio and Illinois. So, you know, the place where we are today um, was emptied of these tribes forcefully, and today many of them are in um, this small piece of northeast Oklahoma. So our population as a tribal nation is just over 6,000, um, which I said is pretty small by comparison to tribes in Oklahoma. In a place like California, that might be a big tribe, but in Oklahoma, that's a smallish tribe. Um, and, you know, we compare it against Cherokee Nation, which has hundreds of thousands of citizens. Um, but as I said, we have three main population centers. Here's a little better resolution on them based on zip codes. Um, our largest population center is in Miami, Oklahoma, in and around our capital and our, where our sovereign land base is. Our second largest is actually in the Wabash River Valley in Indiana, between um, Peru and Fort Wayne, um, in the lands where my people live the longest. And the third largest is in, uh, on our, near our old reservation lands in eastern Kansas to the south of Kansas City. And then we have citizens living in total in 49 states um, within the United States as well as internationally. So a 6,000 population is pretty small, and we're also spread pretty thin across the United States, um, which I'll come back to the, the forces that pushed my community into diaspora when we talk about our history. Um, I'm just going to you know, emphasize really quickly at a sort of 10,000 foot view. Um, a lot of times when we speak to audiences in Ohio or Indiana, it's not something that folks think about as um, fairly recognized tribes and the sovereign status of those tribes. So myself, as, an, as a citizen of my tribal nation, I'm a, I have rights and responsibilities as a member of my tribal nation. Um, and then I'm also a citizen of the United States. Um, and I have rights and responsibilities as a citizen of the United States. I'm also a resident of the state of Ohio, and I have rights and responsibilities based on my residency within this state. And all of those things overlap on me politically in, in ways that sometimes produce friction and conflict, but day to day, I think a lot of times you just kind of operate not thinking about them. Um, but unfortunately, the way I oftentimes hear tribal rights um, and responsibilities described um, in the local media um, is as sort of special rights given to a tribal nation rather than the retained rights that my nation, as well as many others, struggled mightily to retain over many, many difficult decades of history. Um, and so these, these rights are defined and shaped by the very treaty process um, that brought the United States into existence um, as, a, as a nation itself. And so the um, the history of the United States and the history of my nation are intertwined, and the sovereignty of both are also intertwined. Some ways that you'll see visible signs of sovereignty if you go to Miami, Oklahoma, are in the lower left, you'll see our governance building, uh, um, which is where our elected leaders work um, and where our tribal employees work. Um, and um, it's there that they care for the future of our nation. You also see tribal license plates everywhere in Miami. Um, you know, the, one of the first stops when people roll into town is oftentimes Walmart, and you'll see you know tribes uh, tribes plates from all the, the nine local tribes as well as from all across Oklahoma in the parking lot there. Oftentimes, half the lot has tribal plates. Um, where up here in, in Ohio, tribal plates are pretty much an oddity. And I drive a vehicle for work that has tribal plates, and it gets a lot of weird looks from people because the plates don't strike them as as usual or normal. Um, we don't get pulled over anymore like we used to. The local police are pretty much educated on it. But back when folks first started coming to Miami University in the 90s, they're oftentimes pulled over for their plates. Um, and then, you know, because um, my people have uh, thousands of acres of land that we now own again um, after um, three decades of being landless, um, we also have our own police department that polices and patrols and protects those, those lands. Um, and so you'll, you'll see Miami Nation police officers caring and protecting for our nation um, if, you're, if you're in and around, um, in and around Miami, Oklahoma. Um, and then uh, we just included a, a quote to show that, um, you know, the story of our retained sovereignty, you know, it pre-existed European arrival um, and then was formed um, through the cauldron of, of colonization. And, and today, as it operates in the legal system of the United States, formed also through the cauldron of Supreme Court rulings, dating back to some of the earliest um, important rulings in the Supreme Court's history itself, 
um, being used as fodder to establish the power of the Supreme Court in and of itself in the Marshall Trilogy. Just a couple more photos of our living community before I jump back to talk about the past. This is a, a social distanced political gathering uh, last summer to elect um, tribal leaders um, and take care of the, the governance of the nation. This is the general council of our tribal nation meeting together to decide the course for the next year. Um, and you can see COVID's impact. Um, the attendance is uh, probably a third of what it normally would be due to COVID. Um, and obviously we had to meet outside and socially distance. So big, a big shift, but a conscious effort to continue the nation. Um, in you know, minor bureaucratic, sometimes really boring ways, um, but they're really important to our continuance as a people. Um, this is our ele elected chief, Akima Ichipungwia, Douglas Langford, swearing in the folks who have been elected that year. So we have one uh, business committee member, um, two ambassadors, um, young women who serve as ambassadors to the nation at local powwows, and a grievance committee member all being sworn in um, for their constitutional duties for the tribal nation. So again, an, an important act of continuance. And, um, you know, for me, I'm, I'm not a political leader. I'm not a politician. Um, I'm an educator within my community. That's what I've been tasked to do. And um, this is, you know, a, an image that is imprinted or variations of this image are imprinted in my mind when I think about our work with our young people. Um, and um, when we, we talk to them about the process of, um, of loss in our community and then the process of recovery from that loss, or at least a part of that process, and we use the metaphor of this web that by picking up the strings of the web that forms our connections to each other, we then strengthen our community and um, recover things that have been silenced or sleeping or lost to us for a while. Um, and that the web is somewhat organic and changes over time so that while we are um, picking up threads that in many ways we believe our ancestors held, um, we're not seeking to become our ancestors, and we're not seeking to create the community of the past. We're seeking to create a community of the present that can move into the future that builds off of what our ancestors left us. Um, and um, so the, the feeling of holding this web and feeling the vibrations of all this of these the various youth that we work with is something that is in my mind when I look at, at this particular image. So um, the overview of my presentation today is to do a quick history of the Miami tribe. It won't, won't be comprehensive. It'll be really focused more like an educational history is kind of how I talk about it. Um, but to give you context for why our educational um, work is necessary today. Um, and then um, I'll turn to talking about the early years of revitalization from the 1990s until about 2013, and then end by talking about really current stuff, what's happening right now with the revitalization movement in my community. So first, starting with place, with homelands, this is uh, Mia Myonge. Um, when we talk about history for us, we begin not with dates or with people, but with the land. And for us, this is the place that we've lived since time immemorial, time out of mind. Um, our ancestors didn't call it Mia Myonge. They didn't think of it in this exact way, um, but to, uh, allow us to reconnect with it, we, we need new ways to talk about it. And so we've named this space, Miao Myonge, um, the place where the Miami live. And um, this reflects cultural use, so not exclusivity, um, but rather these are the, these are, this is the landscape that my ancestors lived in and drew upon for their economic sustenance and their life ways and the, the foundation of their culture. Um, it, you see the red oval near the center of this space. This is the northern reaches of the Wapashikisipiwe, the Wabash River Valley, mostly in what is today the state of Indiana. And this was the, we, we call it today the heartlands of our homelands. This is where you would find Miao Miao villages in the deep, uh, the densest, um, densest concentration. There are cases of villages outside of the heartlands, but they're sort of the exception to the rule. And um, that space was closer to an exclusive space. Um, other tribes could build villages in that space if they were invited, um, but usually it was viewed as uh, Miami's having primacy in that space. To situate ourselves, let me pull up that laser pointer here. Yeah. To situate ourselves, um, here's where I'm speaking to you from today, this blue dot. 
um, Oxford, Ohio, in the Asinisipe, in the, the Rocky River Valley, or today as it's known, the Great Miami River Valley, um, at the southern edge of our homelands. And then here's approximately where you are all today, if, if you're all in Bloomington, um, in, again, uh, sou- southern edge of our, of our traditional homelands. As I mentioned, it's a shared landscape, um, so I wanted to put and recognize the names of other tribes that we share this space with in the past and t- today as well in terms of our connections. Um, you know, the position of some of these folks, their their exact village locations and what they consider to be their homelands changes over time. So this is just a snapshot from sort of before things started to really come apart at the end of the American Revolution. Um, and, um, you know, as always, I, I don't speak for any of these people and I don't um, tell their stories, but I want to recognize that this is not a, a nation state. Um, it's it's definitely a shared landscape. And for most of our history, we have a long history of peaceful relationships with all of these tribes and, in fact, articulate our relationship to them uh, through the lens of kinship. Um, and while there are aberrant moments where violence occurred between us and, and some of these groups, um, it was always recognized as not the norm. So as I, as I mentioned, things began to come apart for us after the American Revolution. Um, so as, as the Americans signed a peace agreement and achieved peace in their war, um, they were already in the act of beginning a, a decade and a half war to invade our homelands and uh, gain control of land that um, you know belonged to my people and other people. And um, that war was brought to an end with the first Treaty of Greenville in 1795. And the, the price of peace was the cession of most of what is today the state of Ohio. Um, for us, we see it as ceding uh, what is today South uh, West Ohio, um, which was at that time uh, some primal hunting grounds for us. Um, and in the 50 years that followed, we were um, forced um, under duress or other tribes um, ceded um, without us being at the table, the rest of our homelands. So, you know, my, my people had to adjust in 50 years to a complete and utter change of their life ways um, and their cultural connections to land due to treaty sessions. Um, and the last treaty we signed um, in, in our homelands in West Day, Indiana, also agreed in principle to removal. Um, and um, almost immediately people began to resist that treaty. Um, so removal was agreed to it as an idea, but um, the way we talk about it today is that everyone believed that if they didn't want to go, they wouldn't have to, that only those who wanted to go west of the Mississippi would go, and everyone else who wanted to stay behind could stay. That's not how it worked out, but that's what um, we believe the understanding was um, in the 1840s when they signed that treaty. In 1846, though, um, the superintendent of the removal, the Indian agent, called in the army to use the threat of violence to start removal. Um, And on October 6th of 1846, that forced relocation began from uh, what is today Peru, Indiana, Ixquipesinongue. And um, this fractured the nation. So over 320 um, Miamia people were forcibly removed, men, women, and children, and around 150 um, were allowed to legally stay um, at that particular port in 1846. Um, and so this is a, a movement, a forced relocation of the nation. There's a new reservation, a new national land base in um, eastern Kansas. Um, and uh, individual families living on individual family reserve land um, remaining behind in Indiana as um is essentially citizens living outside their tribal nation, but on their traditional homeland. So very interesting and weird um, and sad political story there. And then after the Civil War, um, the same the U.S. Civil War, the same process repeated itself. Kansas was a state um, in a large chaotic omnibus treaty involving a, a bunch of tribes. Um, the Miami tribe again agreed to remove to Indian territory. Um, and once again, the nation was fractured in that uh, individual citizens were given the option to stay behind in Kansas, um, but they would uh, be forced to relinquish their citizenship in the tribal nation if they stayed in Kansas. Um, and so for the nation to continue, folks had to choose to go to Indian territory. Anyone who stayed behind became an individual Indian, um, and they might have had treaty rights that would continue for as long as they were recognized, but they no longer would have tribal rights. 
Um, and so uh, the best we can tell, around 30 individuals stayed behind in Kansas, um, and over 100 made the move to uh, Miami, Oklahoma. There had been a continual population decline in Kansas after removal. So that, you know, in brief, is a story of how you have three population concentrations. The descendants of those who moved to stay with the nation after the U.S. Civil War um, today form the core population in Miami, Oklahoma, as well as others who have decided over time to move there, which there, there are quite a few, actually, um, because movement among the three populations never ceased. So in 1847, you know, a whole bunch of people went back to Indiana. And then back and forth, people went back and forth from Indiana to Kansas multiple times. And then same thing happened after the removal to Oklahoma. Um, so that is, but for the most part, the descendants of those who stayed behind in Kansas are the core families in Kansas today. And the descendants of the families who remained behind in 1846, as well as a group that returned in 1847, um, are the main population in uh, the Wabash River Valley today. Um, after um, the loss of land following allotment in Kansas and Oklahoma and the illegal seizure and taxation of Indian land in, in Indiana, the population began to fragment further from these three population centers. And the Great Depression basically sealed the deal and forced um, hundreds of Miami people to leave one of these three um, population centers to basically seek the economic means to survive. So that's how we end up with uh, people in 49 states today as a tribal nation. Um, that, that fragmentation of the population is due to forced removal and land loss. Um, so it, we'll, I'll come back to this in a second, but it presents a large educational challenge for us as a, as a tribal nation today. At the same time that my community is losing control of our you know, e economy, of our land and our population, we're also losing control of the education of our youth. Um, this is most um, symbolically represented by boarding schools, where you know our youth are taken out of the homes where they were normally educated, um, usually isolated. So they're in a school and they're the only Miami or Miami youth at that school, um, and uh, have you know clothing changed, hairstyle changed, taught English only. Um, taught a Protestant work ethic, Christianity, and a useful trader skill. Um, the goal being, when, when, especially when my, uh, when the most Miami kids were in boarding school, um, the logic was to treat um, our youth like immigrant youth, so that they would leave behind their nation and language and religion of origin and become quote unquote Americans and take up American life ways. Um, and this is, for, for my community, most of our youth were already multilingual. They already spoke English going into the schools. So it wasn't that um, they had to learn English, but rather the lesson they took out was that they shouldn't teach their language to their kids and grandkids. Um, and so boarding schools had a, a, an unsurprising, dramatic negative effect on intergenerational language and culture transmission. Um, at, Many of our kids, though, didn't go to boarding schools. They went to local schools, day schools, on the reserve or reservation. Um, I, I think it could be fair to say the majority went to local schools. Um, but the impact, the end result was the same. Those schools were teaching the same, the same ideas of um, leaving you, your language, your tribal language and tribal culture behind and moving, quote unquote, into the future with an American identity and American culture and English only as a mindset. Um, and so all of that, um, all of that subtractive schooling um, really in almost one generation dramatically changed the face of language transmission in my community so that by the turn of the 20th century, there were very few children under five learning the language. Um, and, and linguists would say that at that point, the language was moribund or destined to, to die. So I think that that story of sort of the last years of this last generation of first language speakers is, is highlighted by these two individuals. So uh, we cop and Mija, uh, Sarah Wadsworth on the right, uh, was born around the time of removal um, in 1846. And she's Wyatanwa, she's a Wea, which 
depends on how you look at it. Um, we we always say that the farther back you go, Wa'atanwa people are Miamia, they're a sub-village of Miami, but today the we are citizens of the Peoria tribe of Oklahoma, so they have a different political identity. But culturally and linguistically, they're very close to um, the Miami villages that would have been north of them on the Wabash. Um, and she was born in Howard County, Indiana, um, moved to Kansas in the 1870s, and then moved to Indian Territory, Oklahoma, shortly thereafter, and then died in Oklahoma. And she was a first language speaker of Miami Atowenge, of our language, and um, was actually a, in a very important source for Miami language and culture when eth ethnographers were coming through from the Smithsonian. Um, and she also served as a translator for folks who are monolingual speakers of our language um, so that um, we could get some of the some of the best stories we have are because she told them or she helped translate for another storyteller. Um, so I, I always like to um, recognize um, the work she did to make sure that our language survived for us today. Um, and then Ross Bundy on the left is from, you know, a generation uh, younger than her. And when he was born, um, there was very little of a sort of fluent speaking community. So he grew up speaking the language, but not in a bigger community like Mikapamija did. And um, while we have recordings, uh, sorry, written recordings from him in the 1960s, we can tell that his language had atrophied by then, um, where he didn't have um, the same level of fluidity in his speech. And you can tell that English was impacting the way he was using his Miami Atawenge. And that's a product of the language loss, that he wasn't in groups regularly since he was a small child speaking the language with people. Um, sadly, he obviously lived into the era of sound recording and even like easy sound recording. And um, the Smithsonian was willing to bring him to DC to record him, um, but they were unwilling to come to him to record. And then because of that, um, he passed away before they were ever able to record him. So we have no extant large sound recordings of our language. Um, what we do have is um, almost 300 years of written recordings of our language. So we say beginning in the 1960s, the last, spe the last first language speakers of our language uh, began to pass away. We think a couple of speakers lived into the 1980s, um, but they were probably partial speakers. So they probably spoke some in their young childhood, but hadn't spoken a lot as adults. And they were never recorded, sadly. So now I'm going to turn to talking about um, our revitalization story, um, how, how we began to pick up the threads of our knowledge um, in uh, the 1990s. So there's this gap from the 1960s to the 1990s. Um, it's a gap that's also a political gap and an economic gap in our community too. So it's, it's too big of a story to tell all at once, but the recovery of language and culture is never just about language and culture. It's connected to to politics, to economics, to, to all these other um, forces that impact our lives. Um, I'm really gonna focus on the educational side of things, um, but if folks have questions about the others, perhaps we can come back to them at the end. So for me, uh, my experience with um, the revitalization of Miami language and culture begins at this place. So what's called the seven pillars of the Nemachisinwisipiwe, the Mississinawa River, very near its confluence with the Wabash River, near what is today Peru, Indiana, or what we call the straight place in our language. And um, this is a community workshop, um, in part organized by the uh, Miami Nation of Indians in the state of Indiana, a 501c3 um, that my family was a part of for years that was seeking federal recognition, but has, has not successfully achieved that goal. And um, the community there came together because um, the, my uh, current uh, the director of the Miami Center, Daryl Baldwin, had been learning to speak parts of our language from written documentation and had learned to, enough to have communicative dialogue in his family at a pretty rudimentary introductory level at this point. Um, but the community was inspired by this and really um, wanted to learn from him. Um, and so this was like literally a, like a classroom in the woods. There was a chalkboard, you know, g tied up with twine to a wooden easel. And, you know, using chalk and um, handouts, Daryl taught us all like the basics, my first words in Miami Um And it was a really empowering week 
um, because it, it, for a lot of us, our, we knew our, our language was absent and missing. Um, you know, I grew up as a youth hearing that it was extinct, um, dead and gone like the dinosaurs. And so what Daryl had done was in, in no small way transformative and shocking, right? He had taken something that was supposed to be dead and gone and turned it into something that was living again. Um, and, you know, children were speaking it and that was really powerful for the community. Um, just to kind of uh, point out something important here. So this is uh, Daryl's oldest son, uh, Jared here, um, as, a, as a really young guy. And he's now a, a language teacher in the community. So he's in his, his early 30s and is actually a, an active language teacher in the community, teaching language in a, in a way that's way beyond the, the rudimentary level where we all started. Um, so there's, there's a lot of uh, seeds that were planted at this first, um, this, this was the first for me, this first um, uh, language um, workshop. And I think the, the important thing to emphasize here is that through language revitalization, people started to form a kind of community again that hadn't been there uh, since the 1930s amongst a lot of our families um, for, for various um, political and land-based reasons. In 1996, um, the Miami tribe began its first official efforts at language revitalization uh, through an ANA grant, Administration for Native Americans grant, to begin training language teachers. And so Daryl um, Baldwin was brought in together with uh, Dr. David Costa, who's right here, um, to begin trying to teach, um, try and teach language teachers. So um, it was, you know, quite a, a step up from just teaching rudimentary language to actually trying to teach people to teach. Um, and in these early years, it was a lot, you know, the teachers were staying just a half step ahead of the students. Um, and the, the goal was really, uh, in these early years, we, we had these absurd dreams of fluency as this idea that sort of we could go from knowing a couple of words to being able to talk all day long in our language and it would happen really quickly. Um, and of course, you know, fluency was kind of a um, ill-defined um, ill-defined status, um, but a big dream. And I would say um, that there was a lot of frustration in those years. After the start of inspiration, then people began to plateau in their language learning. Language growth started and the community started to plateau. And people started to feel frustrated that we weren't achieving these, these big dreams like producing a room full of teachers and being quote-unquote fully fluent in a short period of time. Looking back on it now, I think there was really unfair expectations for us to put on ourselves, but um, I remember definitely that, that feeling. And that's gonna be important when I talk about the connection to Miami University here in a second. Um, so, but many of these people are still involved in the community um, and uh, their children and grandchildren are, or cousins and nieces and nephews are still involved in the language learning community. But I'm gonna focus on, on three individuals um, to, to highlight um, this, uh, process of growth. So David and Daryl I've already mentioned, um, but I haven't talked about Julie Olds in the in the middle yet. So uh, Julie Olds is, um, you know, she was born in Miami, Oklahoma, and Seneca, um, just just to the um, just to the east of Miami, and um, has worked her whole life for the Miami Tribe directly, either as an elected business committee member or as the cultural resource officer for the Miami Tribe. And working together with David and Daryl has been one, the key um, planner of a lot of this work in terms of the, the social strategy, the thinking about how um, community building is essential if you want to advance language and culture growth. Um, and because she's on the ground every day in Miami, Oklahoma, she has a view of the community that those of us who didn't grow up there and don't live there now couldn't possibly have. Um, and so none of the work that any of us do would be po would have been possible to mature, and I would argue right now still wouldn't be possible today to continue without Julie um, sort of sitting at the center and organizing everything. Um, you know, we all recognize that burden can't all sit on one person, so she is training people to be her successor. Um, and so that's beginning to change where not the whole burden doesn't sit on her, but um, I think it's definitely important that I recognize how all three of these people um, sort of cultivated the soil of this garden of our community that had become overgrown with weeds over time. And um, they very much thought long-term about how to 
um, hoe up that garden and how to plant new seeds and how to be patient. Um, and also when, I guess, sometimes not to be patient. So, um, you know, a phrase in the language is muna hiko cheke, um, they cultivate the soil, which, you know, is connected to the idea of actually like hoeing it, tilling up the soil with a hoe. So I mentioned just briefly that we have no audio recordings for our language, no substantial ones. There are a couple of very minor ones. Um, we have 300 years of documentation. And David Costa was key in pulling all this together. Daryl began his early language work just using um, some rudimentary language lists that many of our families had where um, those speakers in the 60s would just create a list of usually nouns and very simple verbs. And it was just sort of meow meow on one side, English on the other. Um, but nothing you know, that approached like a grammatic or, or really even semantic understanding of the language. Um, what David found um, when he began his, um, when he began his uh, dissertation research was a surprising amount of documentation, almost 300 years worth. Um, so I'll just um, show pretty quickly what some of those sources are. So this is um, a source that was produced in Indiana um, by Jacob Pyatt Dunn. Um, who worked with speakers mostly in Indiana. He also traveled to Oklahoma and worked with speakers there. And um, he was a, a lay linguist. He wasn't professionally trained. David said he didn't have the best ear. He couldn't hear some of the sounds in our language, but he was pretty good at semantics. And he did uh, work with elders who were bilingual. So then he could go through and translate with them and he could get more at the underlying meaning of words and phrases than some of the other uh, linguists did. Um, and he got really important stories in both our language and in English um, that are, um, you know, precious, um, precious memories of our community over time. This is an example of an older source. So this is much older um, from the uh, 1700s. This is a Le Boulanger French and Miami Dictionary or Miami Illinois Dictionary. Um, and um, this is this document sits at the John Cutter Brown um, Library at Brown University, um, but was produced in the Illinois country um, out in what is today the state of Illinois, working with mostly Illinois speakers, um, but also some Miami speakers. Um, and this is a really rich text. It's very um, in-depth and lengthy. Um, and it was used by Jesuits to train other Jesuits in their work in uh, conversion to Catholicism. Um, and it's, it's quite an interesting document. Um, it has, of course, its, its um, own dangers, hidden dangers in terms of how you use it. It has to be used very carefully. Um, but it's, it's a rich source because it's, it's the language um, before the era of really high disruption from colonization. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really beautiful um, example of the complexity of Miami Mia Tawenge. And this is uh, an entry, you can see it's organized by French, this one. So um, you have the entry for, for human, um, and then you have the Miami, Illinois, Olenewa, and Mehtoseniake, uh, um, the, the two different phrases that could be used in this particular entry. I mean, I'll come back at the end when we're talking about the tools that we use to advance our work, that these are really inaccessible um, documents, even for the linguists, but they're also super inaccessible for a community member. And so I can talk at the, at the end about the tools we're using to make these things accessible. So those are just two pictures of the sources. Here's the, a list of most of the other major sources. There's a few minor ones that aren't on this list. Um, but you can get a sense of the amount of documentation produced across time from the, the French era in the 1600s into the mid 1700s, a little bit in the American era, um, and then in the early American era, sorry. And then you can see the, the professionally trained linguists and anthropologists um, with Albert Gatchett, Morgan, Michelson, um, Harrington uh, producing materials, and those are some of the best materials in terms of phonetics, especially, um, David tells me, Truman Michelson, who had the best ear and actually, you know, knew how to record using the, the phonetic alphabet. Um, Gatchet also was, was very good. So we have a mix of sources that um, are of differing writing styles, differing writing systems, um, and differing quality, but together um, the data is so robust that David um, and Daryl recognized that they won't finish processing the materials in their lifetime and making them accessible to our community, um, that it's the work of another generation of uh, linguists and community members to finish processing these materials in a way that we can make use of them in our language realization work. So just to give you a, an example of 
sort of how our language works or how I perceive our language working and why that's important. Um, Miao Miao Tawenge or the Miami Illinois language is a polysynthetic language, it's a glutenating language so that we uh, create meaning not by putting together small words into sentences like English does. We put together morphemes, units of sound that carry meaning into one word that communicates oftentimes what a sentence does. And so this leads our words to be really long. Um, but as, as uh, Jared just pointed out to our community in a community blog post, when you count the number of syllables in our word and then you count the number of syllables in the equivalent English sentence, they're actually about the same usually. So it, it's kind of the illusion of length. It's just that, um, you know, the word run, it's like a run on sentence, I guess, as you can think of it in English. Um, so, um, you know, if we, if we take an example of, you know, our, the knowledge of our language, we um, have already turned for years now, I've been creating new words. So the word for kinde lindal kane, the word for computer, um, is formed using the morphemes kind, which is fast, up front, uh, alim, uh, medial meaning think, but to think like with the head, to be calculating, um, and then akane, um, an instrumental final. So it just means it's a thing and it's an inanimate thing. It ends in i, so it's an it. Um, and um, so you can think of a computer as the thing that thinks fast or in English, computer, the thing that computes. Um, so, um, but I want to point out here is culturally, the kind of thinking that we're pointing to is the kind of thinking that happens with the head. And you can contrast that against shteyane, uh, um, which is describing like how I think or feel. And that's on a daily basis when you as an individual are talking about the world around you and you want to express what you're thinking, this is the verb you use. Shteyane, um, not ile lindamane. Um, and so this word is formed of a, of a series of mor morphemes, um, ash or ish, which is really common, uh, thusly, it's in all kinds of um, verbs. Itehe at the, at the heart of the, of the um, verb um, has to do with the heart, it's a heart morpheme. Um, and then on it is the first person singular marker. Um, so it's kind of thinking like thusly lays my heart um, is, is how you think. And that, um, that kind of thinking was intentionally not used for computer because computers don't have um, what humans have in terms of thinking processes. So a, s a small lens into how language and culture, of course, intertwined. And, you know, our language has been expressing our culture since, you know, we came to exist as a separate distinct people. We have certainly learned to use English to also express our culture. But Miao Miao Tawenge does it in a way that English, at least in the foreseeable future, can't or won't as well, and certainly not as efficiently, and not with as much um, meaning for us. So I'm going to transition here at the end to talking about um, the relationship with Miami University. Um, and obviously this is heavily impacted by my own experience um, coming to Miami University to get my graduate degree and obviously working here today. And um, I don't, I'm going to spend a lot of time here, but I don't want to um, leave people with a misunderstanding that everything is happening here. Um, what's happening in Indiana at our Cultural Resource Extension Office, in the community in Indiana, what's happening in Oklahoma with, you know, the elected leaders and the employees of the tribe and the programs there, um, with the programs in Kansas, those are all centrally important. Um, but just because of my own personal experience, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn here to focusing on, on what's happening at Miami University. And I'm going to come back to that description of the moment of frustration that was experienced um, in, the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, this feeling of like language learning plateau. We weren't really growing anymore as a, as a community and, in terms of our language use. Um, and people felt a high level of frustration with that. And um, the partnership with Miami University in part uh, at least deepened uh, and reached the stage it did today because of a response to that feeling of frustration. So today we describe our relationship with Miami University using the verb nepwandinge, um, which it can be translated as learning from each other. Um, and we've had a relationship with Miami that stretched back to the 1970s. Um, when um, Chief Forrest Olds made the first visit to Miami University in, in 1972. Um, in those early years, um, he passed away a few years later. Um, Chief Floyd Leonard then uh, picked up the 
the relationship and carried it forward. Those early years were really heavily dominated by conversations with athletics and development and alumni because Miami University had a race-based mascot um, known as the Redskins at the time. And so that early relationship, I think it's fair to say, wasn't really educational, um, uh, not at its core. And um, it was really a period of time where people were kind of figuring out how or if they were going to um, continue to work together. Um, and I can, if people have questions about that, I can come back to it in the interest of time. I'm going to kind of move forward to saying that in the 1990s, as language and culture revitalization were picking up, um, there were leadership changes at Miami University um, and leadership changes in the Miami tribe that led the Miami tribe to request the end of the use of the Redskins mascot, um, which the university complied with that request. And then there was a transition um, happening at the same time actually towards real education, both for our own youth. Um, so our own youth started coming to Miami University in 1991, um, and that really started to increase in the late 90s, the numbers who would come. And um, also with Miami University students, where Chief Leonard would bring up groups from Oklahoma to do real education with um, non-tribal university students about what it was like to be a tribe in Oklahoma today. Um, in that same uh, period of time, so in, in 2000, heading into 2001, <clears throat> uh, Julie Olds actually literally picked up the phone and called Miami University and said, you know, what we really need is a language research center um, located in an academic context because the tribe doesn't have the resources um, to continue to advance the language research in a way that we can kind of move past this plateau where we're stuck. So much of what is uh, uh, the anthropologists and linguists and priests, what they took out of our community was locked into these documents that weren't accessible in a, in a way to the community. And they recognized because of their history of interacting with Miami University that a university was a place that could help unlock that box. And so she, she put in the request to, to, to open up a research uh, center there, then just called the Miami Project. And Daryl was the first employee in the university said, sure, we'll, we'll try this out. We'll fund it for three years. The university paid for Daryl's position um, and the tribe paid for um, sort of his office supplies and computer and travel expenses. Um, and he began, um, as he said, you know, working in a closet in um, what's King Library, our, our big library here on campus. Um, it had a window, but it, only one person could sit in there at a time. So I think of it as a closet. I remember visiting him there and we had to basically stand outside of the office to talk to him. Um, but he really began um, really major work um, working together with David Costa, who was still living in California at the time, um, who was a part-time employee of the tribe at that point, producing our first dictionary, taking the first, the print dictionary, a print dictionary, taking the first steps to produce more elaborate lesson plans, um, to teach language, um, and moving towards creating our first online dictionary. Um, so the, the Miami project was founded in 2001. In 2013, we transitioned to center status. Um, and from one employee um, with Daryl in 2001 to um, 15 full and part-time employees today in, in 2021, um, and likely to continue growing um, a little bit more in size um, in the very near future. Um, so, you know, again, to, to hit a point I've already made a couple of times, uh, language is what sort of started the Mia Mia project, right? Um, but language is used to articulate the life of the community. And so as, as we continue to get over that first plateau in language learning, what we began to really realize is that what we were revitalizing wasn't just our language and culture, we were revitalizing our sense of community. And in that is sort of all the different stuff of community. Um, so an, one example of that would be revitalizing agricultural practices. So this is pictures of our students working with Mia Mia Minjipe, Mia Mia corn, which is a unique species of corn that we've maintained in our community. Really, um, again, mirroring the language, it was down to two cobs of corn on an elder's mantle in Indiana. And then from those two cobs comes, you know, thousands um, uh, in various fields all over the United States today. And we actually have a, a pretty large field, on or not on campus, just off campus this year that we're gonna be harvesting this weekend. Um, and you know that, that corn is a, a, a species of corn that our ancestors have been in, are interacting with, planting, har growing, harvesting, tending, and eating. And so it's you know, intermixed, um, you know, metaphorically at least we say intermixed with our DNA, right? Is mixed mixed together with Mijipe. 
um, and that our students, you know, they learn to use language in the context of community rather than language for language's sake um, is really the big transition, I think, that got us over that initial plateau. And then today you'll find us less obsessed. In fact, you won't even hear us use the word fluency. We don't talk about fluency. Um, we talk about expanding language use, expanding language domains, um, and more importantly, um, increasing community health and community integrity. And then language filters into all of that because what use is one fluent speaker if there's no place for them to speak? Um, and so we realize we have to advance the language while at the same time advancing the place for the language to exist because it's it, it's got to be intertwined with community. Otherwise, it becomes a thing on the shelf again um, or an individual speaker becomes an icon on a shelf and not integrated into community. Um, and this this is reflected in our, in our youth programs as well. Um, so this is Ewen Zapata um, from 2005, the first year of that program in Oklahoma. Um, and this is us building that community web and talking about what it means to be a part of a Miami community and the place of language within this web. Um, and this program has grown rapidly um, since this particular time period. It now also has um, a program that takes place in Indiana in Fort Wayne. Um, they're week-long language and culture programs. They started as overnight programs and now they're day programs. Um, but the, the impact of um, young people coming in from the time they're 10 to 16 um, has been dramatic in our community, um, basically raising the next generation of um, community members, language speakers, cultural practitioners, and um, then growing. Uh, so this this program is focused on 10 to 16 year olds. Um, we've grown the numbers of programs and the age groups um, involved, which I'll come back to in a minute. So um, closing out with revitalization today, um, we've got currently at Miami University, we have 39 students. So from three in, in 1991 to 39 um, this fall. Um, this past spring, we graduated our 100th graduate of the program. Um, and the impact of these young people as they leave our program and then go to many of them, some of them go to work in our community um, as employees. Um, but a lot of them can then continue to participate in our programs. And so through four years of work with them here, um, we're able to mentor and guide their development as Miami intellectuals. They then go and are like ambassadors back to their homes and families in the diaspora. And they take all this knowledge and experience back home and, and light little fires um, in their own families and in a good way become teachers to their parents and sometimes even their grandparents. Um, and the the growth that we've experienced due to that that model of of treating young people like ambassadors to bring knowledge back to their homes has been really fruitful. And as I said, we've grown um, our programs. So uh, Ewan Zapata in the lower um, light, light blue bubble um, is for 10 to 16 year olds. Um, we created a program um, for six to 10 year olds called Sakachaweta that is a, basically a feeder for Ewan Zapata. We've just launched uh, last year uh, the beta test for a program for caregivers of babies age zero to five called Tejkanawitta. Um, and then this summer we launched the beta for Mayakweta, uh, um, a program for 17 and 18 year olds. Um, and then the goal for some anyway is to actually feed them into Miami University for those who are interested. So we we literally have students here who I've known since they were four or five years old. Um, and then they participate in our program. And then as kids, so I see them for at least a week every summer for all those years. And then they come here and I get to spend four years with them. And then they graduate from here and they go and they, they start their own family. And they take all this knowledge into their, their bring back to their, their parents and grandparents, but also then when they start their own family, either as a biological parent, but we also teach them that as an aunt or uncle in our kinship system, they're oftentimes also a parent. And so even if they're not a biological parent, they still need to think like a parent. And that the growth then is a is an intergenerational feedback loop. And um, we're only just now experiencing sort of our graduates having children themselves. Um, and I'm really excited to see how 
um, they grow things, um, how things begin to take root on their own. And COVID, of course, just like for all of us, uh, was a huge challenge. And um, we had to turn a lot of our programs into online distance learning programs. And um, the benefit to that is that we jump started something we knew we needed to do anyway. Because our population lives in diaspora, home learning and distance learning is the key way we can reach the most people. Not that we're going to move away from face to face once we can come back again, but that we're going to be doing both for the foreseeable future. And that um, in this next year, actually these next two years, we're going to be massively ramping up our online educational apparatus to better um, reach um, folks who live in the diaspora who can't travel to Miami or to Fort Wayne for the face to face programs. So the goal there then, I would say that that home learning bubble is going to get even bigger and kind of be larger than any of the others, but we still want to as much as possible have this this feedback loop of, of growth. Um, and, um, you know, my own kids um, will, um, I have three children and my young, my oldest is a freshman in high school and he plans on coming to Miami University. So, um, you know, my own children will come through this, this same experience. They've come through the programs and they'll come through the school. And um, my hope is that um, that that's uh, the first of many of sort of the children of the folks who came in the earliest years coming here. Um, and excited to see what, what they do with things. As an example of the power of that online education, this is an online web that we created last summer um, in our educational programming. Um, our Ewen Zapata theme was Ewen Di Yangwe. We are related to each other, and it's a year that focuses on kinship. Um, that's the thematic concentration. And at the end of that week, you, we create a web whereby people note their kinship connections to each other. So because our community was under 500 people um, at one point in our history, and we all intermarried, um, we're actually all related to each other in one way or another, if you go back far enough. Um, and so this web um, demonstrates the, the literal kinship connections um, between and amongst the whole group. And um, the size and complexity of this web we never could have created in person because you couldn't have got all these people in one space together face-to-face -face physically, but virtually you could. Um, and um, it was a really powerful example of how, um, how a distance learning can impact our community. Um, again, not that we're going to abandon the face-to-face, -face, which, which is deeply meaningful and important and necessary, um, but... Um, I was I was shocked with the impact of this program as we kind of had to cobble it together on the fly as COVID impacted everything last year. Oh, and then lastly, just talking about those tools I mentioned um, and how those really complex um, kind of locked in old manuscript materials are available to our community today. So this is um, a part of what today we're calling the uh, ILDA suite. It's a Indigenous Languages Digital Archive suite of tools. Um, and these were first built um, by computer science students here at Miami University working in partnership with the Miami Center. Um, and they were built specifically for the Miami tribe. Um, since then, um, working through an organization called National Breath of Life, we've begun to make clones of this software so other tribes who are in a similar place to the Miami tribe can also revitalize their language using um, technology like this. Um, and so that's why it has a little more of a generic name today. Um, but I thought I'd pick a screenshot of an entry that um, is connected to my work at Ayuma. Um, so we talked about creating a, a phrase for angel mounds. Um, and we were actually able to go back into the old Jesuit records and identify a phrase that they used for um, not human-made mounds, but for uh, landscape features that were small bumps in the landscape. Um, and um, so that, that phrase we thought was appropriate, that verb actually we thought was appropriate to use for angel mounds. So the, the word on the very bottom here, I guess I'll zoom in. Pepe uh, kwakeke, means like the, the land with lots of mounds along the Ohio River or near the Ohio River. Um, so an example of, you know, a, a phrase that was recently coined using old entries and then put onto an online dictionary with sound files so that people can learn to, to speak it. Um, and these are accessible by the general public. Um, we similarly have an, an iPhone app that is actually most used by our community. They, they don't use the computer as much as the iPhone app, also built by Miami University students. Um, and you can see here, you know, 
back, back last year we had to we had to coin a new phrase for what we were experiencing. So nese benenge is a um, it's a lung illness, a breathing illness, and then we just combine it with the word COVID to be specific when we need to be. Um, but right now, basically, if we're saying nese benenge, we know we mean COVID because uh, there isn't a lot else going going around. Um, and you know we had to create a phrase for. Um, breathe for a medical mask um, because that didn't exist in our language. We, we had a phrase for a mask like this, but not for a, a medical mask. Um, and this is all again available on Apple Store or um, Google Play, and the general public um, can use it as well. Um, obviously, we build it for our own community, but we don't put any restrictions on it. And then this in the Ilda suite is the tool that the linguists use. So it's not really for the public or for even for the tribal public to use, but this is how they're processing all those documents. So here's the entry where uh, David found the, the reference that we eventually used to coin the term for mounds. Um, and it, it's, on the, it's on, uh, within the Le Gillier document. Um, and you can see the, the modern speech spelling, and that's because the Jesuits use an inconsistent spelling system that actually doesn't accurately transcribe sound. So we always have to put, when we want to actually pronounce it, David has to go through and carefully edit it to make sure that the sounds are accurate. And sometimes he can't um, without additional evidence from other sources. Um, and you can zoom in there and see it. And then here's the actual entry on that page where you can see um, Le Gillier, um noting down what he's being what he's being told about the, the ground that's bumpy um, nearby where he is. Eventually, the goal is within our version of ILDA, all of those language sources I showed you will eventually all be in there. Um, currently, two of the three French manuscripts are in there, and the third, the most complicated one, Panet, will soon be in there, um, which is huge because those are the hardest ones to access. Um, but eventually, all the other sources will be there as well. So the linguists doing this work, when they want to create a new phrase or they want to find an old way for articulating something, they'll be able to look across all the sources um, with one search. Um, which is which is really powerful. And then they take that information and they link it to the online dictionary and create new, uh, in the talking dictionary, they create entries there for learners to use. So learners are never going to use this directly to learn to speak language. It's what the linguistic team draws from to create the talking dictionary that the learners can use. Um, and they share the same database. So the programmers have built it in a way that the database is the same, just two different faces of it. And the last tool I'll point to, which is soon to be added to the suite, is kind of the, the cult, another cultural side. Um, so the ethnobotanical database, um, there's tons of ethnobotanical information in the linguistic materials. And then we have um, interviews done with elders um, who weren't speakers of the language, but were knowledge bearers. And um, the database will eventually, the ethnobotanical database will also be linked linguistically to the other linguistic tools so that when people are learning plant names, they can also get at the cultural information necessary to understand the place of that plant and its relationship to our community um, rather than it just being a word, right? Um, being able to um, reclaim and revitalize the relationship um, with, with these plants. And so an example of an entry from there, um, Asimijakwe or Mishimijakwe, which is a, a plant that's bearing fruit right now. Our, our uh, students were just harvesting some this week on campus. Um, and pawpaw time is one of my favorite times of the year. I'm looking forward to eating some pawpaws and baking some pawpaw bread. And um, it's uh, a lot of fun um, heading into a big harvesting time with Mijipe, corn, Asimina, um, pawpaws, Pyakimina, um, persimmons are next. So looking forward to all of that here in the near future on campus. And then uh, rather than ending with tools and with, again, the faces of our of our community, um, this is our youth singing a song um, to their parents and grandparents and caregivers um, who, you know, brought them to the program every every uh, day that week um, and also to the, the cooks who made their meal. Um, so giving thanks through singing and demonstrating their, their language learning throughout the week. Um, and... Uh, not something we've been able to do on Zoom, unfortunately. Uh, collective singing on Zoom, I don't know if you tried it, it does not work. Um, so I'm really looking forward to being back together with them so we can all, all sing together again. Um, so Mission Neway, big thanks for listening. I think I went a little bit over my time, but if folks have um, questions, I'm glad to stay on the, the Zoom for a while and answer questions. Thank you so much, George. There are a couple of questions um, 
The first of which is, what are some of the biggest challenges you foresee as this project, which has already achieved so much, um, continues? Mm, that's, that's a good question. And something we have talked a lot about um, a whole, is a whole other presentation. I would say the central one is um, that growth is its own kind of challenge. So as are the numbers of people who are interested in participating have geometrically increased. And as the those you know first cultivators, David, Daryl, and Julie get head towards retirement in the next five to ten years, that that's an important challenging moment of transition. You know, how do they successfully mentor the next generation of people to to pick up their work? And how do you continue to keep cohesion in a positive way, not control, but cohesion in the community as revitalization grows, as cultural knowledge grows. Um, because we've watched other communities in this particular moment come apart. And that fragmentation again to rule instead of co greater cohesion being the rule. So I would say that is the, the biggest challenge that, that we face. Uh, there's many, many others, but I would say that's the one that's in the front of my mind. Thank you. Um, another question that has appeared is, what are some of the unexpected benefits you've experienced of language revitalization? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, and something that, that we've talked quite a bit about. And it's not something that I'm, um, well, what I'm about to respond with is really um, other folks' work. So I want to recognize my colleague, uh, Haley Shea, who heads up our uh, Nipwayone assessment and acquisition team. Um, but one thing that we noticed anecdotally is among those who were in the uh, coming through our youth programs is that they're, as they learned language there and participated in the programs, their identity as Miamia people became strengthened and they were like healthier people um, and our community then was becoming healthier. And that was all anecdotal. And so we began, a, a, and it's still going, a longitudinal research project to look at the ways in which language and culture revitalization actually help a community heal from its damaging past and um, create the ability to respond in a resilient way to, <clears throat> to things in, that might challenge us in the future. And I would say, you know, back in 1995, when I first attended uh, a language workshop that was not in my thinking of like, that had nothing to, that had nothing to do with language. Um, and um, what we're finding is that it, it has um, impacted the community in, in really dramatic ways um, in terms of, of health and strength. I think that's a really, really powerful thing to think about. Um, another question just popped up from Dr. Black. Um, and she's saying, as a citizen of uh, a nation in Oklahoma with language programs as well, oops, hang on, I apparently lost my ability to use my mouse. Um, I find what you're doing extremely innovative. Have you heard conversations with other tribes recommending approaches? Yes. So, um... And if there's one thing tribes like to do, it's talking about various strategies for language revitalization. Um, so, you know, early on, I attended a lot of intertribal language conferences. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a, a, a huge conversation always ongoing. I think that the key thing to differentiate is, you know, what Cherokee Nation is able to do because they have fluent speakers and and a large number of fluent speakers is that they can do intergenerational language transmission and immerse people in the language. Um, and a Cherokee Nation has people, of course, in diaspora, but they also have, I think, at least from my perspective as an outsider, and in a really large core in Oklahoma that creates a, a cultural nest that can be the space where the language then lives. And so for communities like us who do not have fluent speakers, who do not have sound recordings, who are relying on printed materials to revitalize from, and are much smaller and fragmented, we have to rebuild all of that. So we have to rebuild the nest within which the language can be spoken, as well as we're literally like 
rebuilding the language. Like we don't understand certain parts of the language. We have no elder to turn to to ask, how do you say this? What does this mean? You know, is this sentence structure right? Does it make sense? It's a lot more, we can answer those questions, but it's a lot more painstaking. It takes a lot more time. We're, we're trying to be really careful, not that we don't make mistakes and we have to like unlearn things we learned and relearn them as we, as we get better at understanding our language. Um, but it's just, it's a very different kind of response. And so not every tribal community is in any way like ours. Um, but those that are, um, that have no living speakers and are revitalizing from documentation, um, we've increasingly been working with them together through National Breath of Life, um, which is a, is a whole other presentation, but it's just an organization set up to work together with communities who are in just that spot. So, George, I have a question for you that may be unanswerable. Um, it seemed like many of the archival resources you're working with were ones that were um, created by men, presumably talking predominantly to other men. Are you aware of any um, loss of gendered knowledge that has happened because of how these languages were, were um, documented? Oh, I have to apologize. I, I, my office is right next to a busy street and um, also parking spots. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so the French sources are all male priests um, with their own um, European and Catholic baggage in, in the fray as they're doing interviews. Some of their sources were likely women because some of the most successful converts in the first wave of conversion in the Illinois country were women. Um, but most of the data seems to be... Uh, from the male gaze. Um, in the early American period, it's all men to men. Um, by the time you get to the anthropological period, uh, late 1800s, early 20th century, with folks coming from Washington, um, there you actually have quite a few female sources. But you also see the, the best examples I can think of are in the traditional stories, um, in all the Sukana uh, winter stories, is you can see, like, especially where a story might be from an, from an, English um, United States perspective might be viewed as like sexually risque, the women storytellers were muting that part of the story. Um, and we know that because other versions of the story were recorded and the sexual stuff is in there. Um, and so you can see the way in which a Miao Miao woman or a Peoria woman interacting with a male outsider were not going to expose certain parts of their culture. And that's in part due to gender. Um, it's also would say in part due to just trying to protect culture from outsiders who might mock it or not understand it. Um, so that's that's where like you clearly see evidence of um, self-editing. Um, but to go a step further, <clears throat> um, you know we're missing um, lots of information in the linguistic record that talks about coming of age. Um, it talks about the transition as um, children become adults. And of course, that process um, was affected by biological difference and gender. And that's not, um, those kinds of things are not contained in the linguistic record. And um, so that, that impacts men and women, but I would say um, there's slightly more data in other sources for coming of age for men. And a lot of the data about women um, and especially like first men sees all the important transitions that happened then among uh, what was probably a closed group of women, none of that material has been the we can tell recorded in linguistic sources. And so it puts us in a place where uh, it's a part of the, the nascent discussion among cultural leaders today is well, what do we do when there is a need in our community for that and it's, there's no sources for us to turn to. Um, and that's that's a very early days discussion in our community that, um, yeah, we don't have answers yet, so I can't I can't share beyond that. But definitely, um, we see the gap in the records due to to gender. Thank you so much, George. Um, you've been incredibly generous with your time and with your knowledge, and so I would like to close by noting Dr. Hiller's um, comment in the chat where she noted 
the, the work you are doing is important, not just for your own community, but with shared concerns across the world, um, as far as communities that are engaged in language re revitalization. So thank you so much, George, and thank you to our audience. I appreciate all of you being here. Um, and until next time, have a wonderful evening. Thank you, George. Anyway. <laughs>